Um, Brian, unless you think it's going to get too hot, could we close the door for the sound? Thanks. Thanks. If people get hot, you could just start doing this and we'll turn the fans up. <laughs> um, so let's just take a moment and, and just sense the mind of the room, because it's changed, right? Of course. But let's, you can just notice how it's changed. Um, and that you're different already than you were when you came in, which would happen anyway. But we can just take a moment and notice what's shifted. And how much power there is in silence. It's such a simple thing to practice. And it does so very much for us to practice silence through our day. In, in traditional um, ashrams or in a monastery, if you've spent any time in places like that, um, not in monasteries where they're fully silent, but um, there will always be periods of silence throughout the day, marked throughout the day. And it really offers you something so you know, I just say that and I note that the next break that we take uh, won't be in silence, but you may want to be in silence. <laughs> so you can discern for yourself when it's useful for you to keep the energy in. As soon as we release the energy, it's very difficult, very difficult not to release the energy and go back on the horizontal line. It just goes out. So there's something very simple. We don't have to work at it really hard. But as we quiet our, our prana, our energy, our voice, it allows the energy to move in a different way and to absorb in our being in a different way. So um, already we've been doing one of the most powerful spiritual practices. And one of the most powerful ways, actually, to open this inner door is, is through silence. Um, so there are two sort of primary ways to move from kala to mahakala, to open the inner space, the interiority of our being, which we already have. It's not, again, not something that we get, but how we make our internal world conscious for ourselves. So I said, for anyone who's gone into deep sleep, you've had an experience of Mahakala. And that's true, but you haven't had a conscious experience of Mahakala. So the practices, the spiritual practices, are meant to create the context where you can stay aware and be present and be absorbed or dissolved into Mahakala with presence, rather than blipping out. Very different. <laughs> very different, right? But we know, we know because we go into deep sleep that that state is available to us. We pass through it regularly, hopefully every night. <laughs> and actually, right, if you don't sleep, what happens? You kind of go crazy, right? Those of you who have any kind of insomnia know, right? And physically, you can't sustain yourself after a period of time. So actually, it's, it's necessary to our vitality, to our life, to enter that stream, to be able to live at some point through the day in the vertical time. And we're built so that when we sleep, we go there, even though we might not have the power of consciousness to be present as we go there. So it's something to think about, right? It's nourishing. It's a nourishing space for us. Um, so there's two ways, two primary ways, to consciously enter this space. W one is through piercing through an outer awareness. So to go externally and pierce through. And the other is to go internally and pierce through. Both are inner. Both are inner experiences. But one will be with the senses open and the senses going out. 
and one will be with the senses withdrawing and the senses going in. Everybody with me? Okay. People have different preferences, okay, for, for these. So I want to state this because somehow the idea generally is that we have to withdraw the senses, but there are actually practices where we extend the senses or we, we sort of, uh, in a way, we withdraw the senses because we enter the sense completely into another object. I should say it that way. So we withdraw our sense of self, my sense, and we, we enter our senses completely into the flower or into the table or into the outer object. And in a way, in the same sense, we've withdrawn ourselves. Okay. Um, so I wanted to give um, some examples of this going out, uh, the extension version. And again, when I was younger, um, now when I was in my early 20s, I went to Boston and they were having an exhibit. What's the big museum in Boston? The yeah, Museum of Fine Arts. Um, they were having an exhibit of Monet's water lilies. And I went. And it's very rare. I mean, you can go see retrospectives, of course. Um, but it's very rare to be able to really see a single artist's work over their entire life in one gallery. It doesn't happen, or multiple galleries, right? But in one sort of setting. And it's so profound. Um, I mean, at the very beginning, what it does is sort of, it reminds you that you have a whole path, you know, we get so sort of like myopic about this moment or like this didn't go well or this went really well, you know. And there's a whole process that's going on of development in our life, right? So when you can sort of stand and see someone's vast place, I find it very relaxing. Um, sort of lets me let go of my in individual grasping to the moment that I'm in a bit. So, so I'm looking at... Um, I'm looking at Monet's experience, and it was very revelatory for me because what I experienced was witnessing a model of someone who went from a horizontal space to a vertical space throughout the course of their artistic exploration. And it's very clear when you look at his paintings, and you can see it happen. So I just pulled for, for those of you that are sitting over here again, you might just want to walk around for this so you can sort of look. Um, can we make it bigger? So, yeah, pull it back a bit. That's probably fine, yeah. Um, so this is one of his early, um, my notes, but do you have it? It's like a bridge over a water lily pond, basically. He's stating what it is, what he's seeing, OK? And so you can see there's, um, uh, there's a horizon line, right? So you can, you can read the water from the vertical space, right? And it's a fairly, albeit we recognize this now as you know having maybe not completely realistic, but it's a fairly realistic painting. You can read what's going on there, right? So. This is sort of where he starts, seeing things on this horizontal line very directly in the way we sort of would say, like or ordinary reality. This is the story. It's a bridge. It's a pond, et cetera. Um, let's look at the next one. So then he goes. Um, point, but I think if you're standing in front, you can still actually sense a bit of verticality. You can still sort of sense the horizontal line um, of the horizon, that there's a bit of trees at the top, and then there's sort of water. But obviously, it's starting to sort of morph in, into itself, right? 
And this one, I think also he's still calling um, a, a pond of water lilies or something like that. So he's calling it still sort of what he's seeing. And then the next one, which is again um, years later, n now we've really moved a bit more. Series. So he calls this yellow nirvana. So he's gone from a bridge over a pond of water lilies and water lilies in a pond to yellow nirvana. And again, so here you can see we've, we've pretty much lost, we've lost the horizon line at this point. So, you know, in those of you that are studying Buddhism, it's like we've lost duality at this point, right? He's, he's going into a singular, a unified vision, a unified plane of perception. Um, and just technically, I mean, on a very like sort of um, direct level, he stopped looking like this and he's looking like this now, right? So he's sort of gone from this horizontal space and he's, he's just going down into this water, into this one place that's right there. He's not moving out anymore. Um, and then if you can click to the last one, this is um, close before his death. Oh, actually, Jed, I think that one, I think the second one you showed is actually the, the last one. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, so go, go to the fourth one now. That's why I was saying I couldn't quite tell from my adventure. So this is actually the second one. So, so here you can see there's... You can read them as water lilies, right? Sorry. So, so this is our second one. And then let's look again at the third one now. Yeah. And then we'll go to the fourth one. Yeah. And, you know, it's sort of, of course, these are representations and it's projected and so and so. These are huge paintings, by the way. Like, they go across this whole wall. Okay, so they're not little. They're this, these very vast scales. Um, and, and this is like a part of what would be the whole wall. It's hard really to have a representation of those whole paintings. Um, but here you can see again, we're, we're moving into sort of light and color and um, we're discerning shapes, but you know, if you weren't told this was in a water lily series, maybe you wouldn't necessarily say that, <laughs> that you were looking at a pond of water lilies. Maybe you would, I don't know. And what he's I- He's really looking down. He's really looking down, yeah. <laughs> totally, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, his relationship to reflection, so he's, he's painting the reflection of what's above or what's on this, this vertical outer plane, and he's painting it, you know, on the horizontal plane. So in these last series, um, so he, again, I don't remember the exact title. It, it'll be in the notes that I give you, but um, like this one is called Water Lilies. So he, he goes through this space of bridge on a pond of water lilies, water lilies, yellow nirvana, water lilies. And it's interesting that there's a, um, a Zen story that's often told where it says, in the beginning of the path, mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. And in the middle of the path, mountains are not mountains and rivers are not rivers. And at the end of the path, mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers but they don't look the same as they did when they were first mountains and mountains and rivers and rivers, right? So I, you sort of, he goes through that same space where he's looking at these water lilies and they become something else for him and then he keeps going, you see? So he doesn't sort of stop in that space where he's just there, he keeps going until actually he circles back around to that connection of the horizontal line where he can say, these are water lilies. This is my reality of the water lilies now, right? And I found witnessing his transformation so moving. And for me, it was, um, it was a guide. You know, it was a moment of having a guide appear, uh, which is so key, you know, to be able to see that something like this is possible. Um, I also want to say, because I'm showing them in a fairly linear, I'm sort of presenting it like he had this very linear progression. But actually, if you look at the paintings over the 30 years, it's really more like this. You know, like he, he's eventually, you could say, yes, he had this progression, but none of our paths are that direct, really. 
So we all have to have some leniency that sometimes we have experiences of the inner world and we, you know, then we don't for a period of time, but it all accrues meaning. So, um, you know, he has, even in this last series, actually in the last series he doesn't really have any that are any more with the horizontal plane. He's really gone beyond that to a sense of unitive field. He's not reading duality in that way anymore on his canvases. But he still has ones that look more, quote unquote, realistic than not. Um, and the same is true back sort of in the beginning. You have ones that sort of start to nod towards this in the very early series. And so if we look at our lives, um, sometimes we wait for like the big experience. And we're like, when's the big experience going to happen? But chances are you had a big, ex big experience already. <laughs> Maybe you forgot or you didn't recognize it, right? We miss it somehow. And also to say that the experiences of the inner worlds, they're not all like, oh, you know, sometimes they're quite simple, quite small, quite humble. Those are e of equal value to the ones that we might say are these big profound revelations. A little bit in is as much as a lot in because you're in vertical time there's no time there you're out of self it's not like you can be a little bit out of self or a lot out of self it's, if you're there for a, a millisecond or you know you eat a strawberry and you're there that's it right so the practice as i was saying is just simply um, just simply <laughs> sensing how to shift the emphasis so that you can rehabituate yourself to tuning into that reality on a more regular basis and living from there. It's available to us. Um, the other thing that's interesting to know about Monet, and some of you may know this, um, is that he was afraid that he was going to go blind, although he didn't. But it wasn't like today where you can just go get a laser surgery, you know, and have it done with. So his vision was changing. And so you can think to yourself, well, he just can't see <laughs> anymore. So that's why he's painting like this. You know, he's not seeing clearly anymore, right? And that would be to really dismiss something, a transformation that's happening for him right, in the heart, in, inside his being. And we do this all the time. It's like, oh, you know, oh, so that's it. That's why that happens. And we sort of dismiss it, OK? There are all kinds of, you know, in a certain way, you could say he's losing his sight because another sight is awakening for him. It's interesting. You know, when we m meditate, um, in a more traditional way, the, you know, the other way of going in, we close our eyes, we try to withdraw our senses, and we do this to open a different kind of sight, to open a different vision, where it's very difficult to keep our eyes open and actually touch a different type of vision. It's much harder for us because we're so inundated to like, Dima, camera, mm, uh. like it is what it is, right? So when we, when we close off that field, it creates a space where we can touch something else. But of course, you can touch that there, too. And there's all kinds of stories throughout history of beings who, when, as they're gaining wisdom, they go blind. It's really interesting. Um, and you know, last series, we listened to some Beethoven and all of those things he composed while he was deaf. Right? So um, there's a great story of, in, the, in Greek mythology of Tiresias, the seer, S-E-E-R, right? And um, he, I think I've told this before, but he sees Athena, who's wisdom, the wis goddess of wisdom. So he sees wisdom or ultimate reality naked, meaning directly. And he goes blind. And, and her, her sort of um, gift slash curse to him is that sh she makes him go blind. But then, of course, he's gifted with another sight for the rest of his life, right? So um, I just mentioned that because I think it's something that we do sometimes where we, we encounter someone or something that's had um, a shift of, of reality or an altered perspective, and then we find a way to make it ordinary. 
we find a way to sort of fit it into what we know. And so we might, you know, we might look at this and have some sense, like I did when I was, whatever I was, 22 or 23, like, oh my god, this guy had some experience that I've never seen before. And then maybe you hear, well, he had cataracts, and you go, oh, well, he had cataracts. And in a way, it doesn't matter one way or the other. Maybe, he, maybe that's why he did paint like this, because he had cataracts. I don't know. What's better for you? You know, it's like, what's more interesting? What, what's going to make your life richer? And to just notice the habit that we have for pulling things down to our current sense of understanding and trying to fit it in and sort of, and mostly we try to fit it in so we can dismiss it. Because when we're open to the inner space, when we open the inner door, we're totally discombobulated. I mean, we're, it's like we're totally thrown off our game. And so for most of us, most of the time, if we're thrown off our game, what do we want to do? If you're thrown off balance, it's like, I got to get myself back on balance. You know, I got to figure this out. I have to put it in a chart. I'm going to like write it down. I'm going to somehow make it make sense in a rational way, right? These experiences, they don't, they don't make sense in a rational way. <laughs> and that's part of their power, right? So, mm, so that's the outer way. And, um, or that's one way to sort of talk about the outer way. In the yogic traditions, there are meditations like you um, fix yourself on a candle. And you try to attune yourself and become one with the candle. To go in, right, to pierce through that object, to become that object. Um, in the Native American traditions and uh, other traditions too, they have practices like you find a sit spot. Do people know about this practice? This is a nice practice. If you like nature, this is really lovely. So you find a spot out in nature or out somewhere um, where you feel safe, where you're not concerned, and where you can be alone. And this becomes your sit spot. And you go every day, and you sit in the same spot every day for a period of time, 15 minutes, an hour, something like that. You don't set any parameters for what happens to you during that time. So you don't do a particular meditation or try to have something happen. You just sit and witness again and again and again the same spot. And of course, naturally, things are going to shift for you. right? So you create a space of stillness and silence, but you're witnessing externally. Um, so if you're someone who really loves going outdoors or taking hikes, you, you might want to try that practice and find a sit spot. And you know, hopefully it doesn't take you an hour and a half to drive there, because that would become onerous. right? But if it's someplace you can get to quickly, fairly quickly, and can commit yourself to going every day, or let's say five times a week or something like that, that can be a very beneficial practice to do, to start to pierce through the, the veil. Um, and just notice right, what's happening to the mind during that time. Um, I think we have a, a real resistance, or you know, maybe it's too strong to say fear, but I think if it's uncovered, it probably is some kind of fear um, of repetition in this society in particular. And the, that line, the vertical line, in a way you can't even say it's repetition, but it's, it's plunging into something. So you're going through something rather than going to a new thing along the horizontal line. All the spiritual practices in any tradition have a repetitive nature to them. They're not about increasing knowledge. They're actually about ceasing knowledge. So one of the things that I find um, so beautiful about Buddhism, as I say probably every class, is that it's not about starting anything. It's actually about stopping things. The, the ultimate realizations all come when things stop, when, when that sense of the mind moving forward ceases. And you can go into one thing. So it's useful for us to look at what we are repeating, because of course we are repeating all the things all the time. And probably often many of them are habits that are harmful to us, that are not beneficial repetitions, or that are grooving in some pattern that actually causes pain. Right? But in general, you know, to think about um, 
how you feel if, mm, how to say this? The opening of the inner door is not a relationship to thought, but it has to have some kind of love in it. And it's really important to tap into that in a way that's meaningful for you. So we're seeking a deep, deep intimacy with our own self. Not just with other things, but with our own reality. And most of us, most of the time, don't have that much intimacy, actually, with our reality. We're on a pretty, like, um, at best, you know, like, acquaintance level <laughs> with ourselves, actually. And, and just as we do with acquaintances or people that we see every day, we just assume we know them somehow. We assume that we know ourselves. And it would be worth, it's, it's of great richness to um, spend time becoming intimate. And, and part of intimacy is questioning, is doubt, is getting lost, is being found, et cetera, et cetera. Right? But that energy of confidence that I was talking earlier, that sense that it's worth going into, that'll carry you. So you have to be willing, as you go through these practices, as you try to enter these inner spaces, you have to be willing to be offended <laughs> repeatedly. You have to be willing to be ignored, like sit at the water lilies for 30 years, 20 years maybe, until something shifts for you, you know? So that y you can't come to the object of your love, your yourself, your reality, or another, a glass, whatever it is, expecting to get something from it, demanding something from it. You know, sitting down in your prayer practice like, okay, God, show up. I'm here. You know, it doesn't work that way. So we have to be willing to, to take all kinds of experiences, offended, ignored, loved more than we can bear to be loved is another one. You know, to to love, in, to, to feel ourselves loved or accepted in ways that we're not actually ready to accept ourselves or to love ourselves, which often offends us. Or so we step away and we want to, you know, we want to ignore that. Um, you know, that these practices are not built to have us be comfortable. We have to be willing to be revealed in all of our glory and all our pettiness and all our banalness. We can't hide, you can't hide anything from yourself in case you didn't know that. <laughs> you know, it, like, we really want to focus on sort of all, of course, you know, we want to focus on all the good things. And we have really, um, even those of us who you might say, I have low self-esteem, you have a really good view of your low self-esteem. Like, you, you're, you're really sort of advocating for the best parts of yourself most of the time, you know. So, to be revealed in sort of your pettiness and your lack of generosity and your jealousy and your anger and your desire, that is par for the course. That must happen. It must happen. And it's very uncomfortable and very challenging. We have to be willing to be bored for long periods of time, perhaps, in our, in our practice. We have to be ready to be overly excited, overly disappointed, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, if we're looking for a particular feeling or a particular result, we'll miss the potential of what, what we can have in our intimacy, whether with another person or with our own spiritual practice. So the, the drive of the intimacy is not, oh good, I got this, now I'll stop. That vertical line, which is intimacy, it goes on forever. Whatever experience happens, it just keeps going, okay? Monet was considered a great radical. I mean, now we're used to seeing these, these images, so they don't strike us. But at his time, it was like, oh, what are you doing? You know? And so we have to have some kind of courage also to be able to speak back from that place. Um, there's a, um, a book that I really love. It's called Taste of a Man. And in it, um, it's a great book on intimacy. Um, I'm trying to remember, it's a Serbian writer, a Serbian woman who, who um, wrote the book. And in it, it's a, a love affair, a great love affair, a, a, a level of, of love that's quite extraordinary between she and this other man. And, um, 
and it becomes clear that in their worldly life they're going to have to be separated for various circumstances and they can't it's like they're feeling the between a rock and a hard place right it's like there's nothing they can do and the man in the story his response to that is sort of to start to let himself die like he stops eating and he stops going out and because he doesn't want to leave her and he doesn't want to deal with what he has to sort of deal with in his life he doesn't have that energy and she realizes at a certain point that she will have to she's the one that has the more energy in the in the space there or is being asked to be the role of the one who sort of has more energy and um and so eventually there's an agreement not a spoken agreement but there's a deep intimate agreement between them that she'll kill him and she does and then she goes through a process of eating him so that he's she's totally united with him right and i'm reading this book and there's part of me that's going well this is very offensive <laughs> you know or like this is really out there you know and um and there was another level that was going whoa like there's a level of intimacy that's it that's really not fitting into conventional society you know it's just not it's not okay it's not polite it's, it's you know you're not going to see it on HBO <laughs> or Showtime you know there's not going to be a YouTube video about that and um that that kind of potential to go off the charts i'm not suggesting anyone eat their lover okay but i just mentioned the story because for me that was another model of being sort of knocked off the horizontal line a bit like oh that's another level of possibility of communication that in a way my mind even still when i think about it is a little like mm, no nope. right so So we've been talking about the outer, okay? Uh piercing the outer. So you can find a sit spot, you can um take take an object and spend a a lot of time with an object. You can just sit and let your senses um let your senses dissolve. So allow yourself to dissolve into the sounds, allow yourself to dissolve into the visual context that you're having, etc. You can do it every time you eat, eat the strawberry and see if you can enter the experience of the strawberry. Um the other way is that we go internal, right? And this is a uh, more traditionally what is understood as prayer or meditation. Um and I I went to some of the Christian contexts for this to study about this one. Um and in particular I was reading St. Teresa and Thomas Merton and they both very clearly say uh the entrance the entrance into the castle and St. Teresa directly talks about it as a castle is is through prayer is through meditation and um Thomas Merton speaks about it as serious reflection so reflection that is actually focused on a particular goal not just reflecting on any old thing like how much you're pissed off at your mother but a uh, reflection that has a focused intent and both of them say again very clearly that this experience is not of the mind but of the heart and must be of the heart otherwise no entry will actually occur um i'm just going to read you this from saint teresa because it's uh it's clear she says now let us return to our beautiful and charming castle and discover how to enter it this appears incongruous if this castle is the soul or the highest self god right clearly no one can have to enter it for it is the person him or herself one might as well tell someone to go into a room he's already in so she's bringing up this absurdity of saying like enter your you know go inside i'm already inside right there are she says however very very different ways of being in this castle Many souls live in the courtyard of the building where the sentinels stand neither caring to enter farther nor to know who or what dwells in that most delightful place and what it is in it and what rooms it contains 
And uh, she goes on to talk about how those who live on the peripheral of their inner life are totally inundated by the, the thought mind, by time, by what's happening, what happened, what's going to happen, and, and they can't get off that space, right? So one key to going into these spaces is to quiet the mind. Um, so lastly, in this section, I, I just want to talk a little bit, and we'll look at the other images, Jed, um, about five things that we need to enter the inner door, to go into the inner space. Um, so you want to bring up the, uh, no, bring up the shaman. Yeah, OK. So the first thing that we need, um, kind of guide. And um, I put this image up because we actually ended up putting this up in our house because we loved it so much. And uh, when I look at this being, you might want to at some point go up close to the image. But to me, he has a very clear sense um, of being in between the worlds. And so when I look at him, I'm reminded that there's a, a passageway to something else, that there's something beyond what I'm ordinarily experiencing. So I find him inspiring. And you know, I think everyone needs, if you're, if you're moving on this path to try to enter into the interior realm, the interior kingdom, and to do any kind of exploration in the interior kingdom, you really need support. And you really need models around you. Okay, so. I'm sure many of you already have models and you have guides. It's helpful to have a, a personal guide in your life who can like help you and talk to you when you go, uh, I'm really bored, or whatever it might be that comes up. right? But it's also helpful to have in images, music, whatever it might be. And it's personal to all of you, but that when you encounter that thing, it, re it opens some space for you. And you go, oh, that's what I want to go towards. right? So the point is not, we say in the Buddhist tradition, you become your teacher, OK? Now, I'm not going to go put on a bunch of feathers and get a drum and become a shaman in this kind of way. That, that would be a, a, a misunderstanding of that sense of taking a guide, OK? So it's not that you become the guide like you so, somehow sort of outerly try to put on that space, right? You become the guide in the sense that the guide is driving you towards your inner self. So ultimately, you become yourself, your highest self, which is what it is that you're seeing in whatever it is that's inspiring you. And that might look radically different, will, no doubt, look radically different than whatever it was that was guiding you. Right? I, I remember I was at a talk with um, Bill Viola, who's a great visual artist who I, who I really love. And they were asking him about um, people who were imitating him, or um, what's the word I'm looking for? When, yeah, I mean something like that, right? Like they were saying, oh, you know, here are all these other artists that sort of look—it sort of looks like your work, right? And they were saying, what do you think about that? And he said, well, you know, first off, I'm very flattered that anyone would think enough of my work that they would want to try to make work like my work. You know, so he was very generous. He was saying, I'm very, ins I'm, I'm, I'm very moved by that. Um, and he said, but if you really want to emulate someone, he said, you have to take it in and eat it and digest it. And it will come out looking like something quite different than what it was that you saw. And he said, most people, they don't do the digestion. They just sort of take it and roll it around in their mouth and then like spit it out and say, this is mine. I got a little bit of my saliva on it. It's mine. You know? and, and he said, that's when it stops at imitation. And again, it doesn't become intimate. It doesn't have an intimacy to it. So very important when you, one, very important, you have models and you have guides. And if, if you can't. Think of someone right away or something right away that guides you to the interior space. I would say, please take some time and try to think about that and find it. Look for it. It's, it won't be hard to find, I'm sure, if you have your eyes open for it. 
but you probably need more than one <laughs> because our, we change all the time, right? So we have a sort of, like in our house, we have a kind of rotating gallery of things, you know, or on my altar, I'll have a rotating gallery because the same image doesn't work across 10, 20 years because I change, right? So, um, so one, find a guide, but then two, have the courage and the, and, and the power to digest, to take it in and digest it so that it really becomes your own, yourself, okay? Um, not a copy. Oh, copy, that's the word I was looking for, when people copy you, right? Um, so uh, the, the next thing that we need, which is, again, the next preliminary, just to look at it in a different way, is some kind of confidence. So can we call up Rosa? Um, so I put an image of Rosa Parks here. It can't, it doesn't get bigger. That's okay, just so everyone can see. Everyone knows who Rosa Parks is. You don't have to, but does everyone know? Okay, good. <laughs> That's good. Um, so I was thinking about her. You know, we've just had this big anniversary of the, all the civil rights stuff, and thank you. That's helpful. And, um, and I was thinking, you know, this image in particular is moving to me and emblematic of, of this quality that I'm bringing up. She's still... It's, it's not maybe the ordinary sense that we might have of confidence, like, you know, someone that sort of has this energy going out. She's in herself, she's calm, and yet, of course, we know the story and we know how extraordinary it is, what it is that she's doing in this moment, right? So, and this is a picture that actually got set up um, after the event, but, um, but still, you know, you, you, you feel her, her power there. Um, <coughs> So, does everyone know the story of Rosa Parks? Okay. For 10 seconds. <laughs> For 10 seconds. So, um, she was sort of the, the first that, she started the um, bus boycott in Montgomery and, um, you know, basically walked onto a bus where the, uh, um, the blacks were told they had to sit in the back and she sat in the front and said, you know, I can sit here. And, um, and that, that was sort of the bullet that, I don't know, would you say, David, I don't know my history so, so well, but that really started like um, all the sit-ins and all the, yeah. it, it, it was a real like, it was a focal point, it was a focal point of the civil, the civil rights movement. Yeah. You know, she wasn't a leader, she just did it. Yeah. 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 There's a great, a great quote from her where, where she says, uh, you know, because it's like the idea is like she's gotten this bus and instead of walking to the ba back, she sat in the front. So it's like, oh, you know, you must have been so tired. You had to just sit in the front. And she's like, no, I wasn't tired. <laughs> I was just tired of what was happening, <laughs> you know. And uh, I, I had had enough of, of that, you know, that way of living. So there's something about the confidence that you need, the, this realization of the importance of your life that, you have enough self-respect to put the energy into making your life meaningful for yourself and for other people, and that takes real energy. So in order to do something like what Rosa Parks do, you, you actually have to have tremendous self-respect. And um, when we lose our self-respect, we, we lose our energy, we lose our power, we lose our confidence. So um, Again, I would find her as a guide, you know, not only is she sort of representative of confidence for me, but, but she has a good sense of guide. So um, the, uh, the last thing I want to say about the sense of confidence is that it doesn't mean necessarily that you don't have doubt or you don't have fear or you're not um, unsure in some way. And probably most of the time, the real resonant confidence is mixed in with all kinds of doubt. And, and all kinds of questions, but that there is some sense, we could call it faith, um, intuition, necessity, you know, she just did it, right? There's, there's some sense that even with the doubt, you still make an action, right? So you can think about the times in your life when maybe you didn't necessarily know what the right choice is, and yet you did make the right choice if you look back. Right? So you can, you can trust yourself that there is an energy. Confidence doesn't mean you know everything. 
and you're totally certain about everything all the time, that actually is quite a precarious position to just think like, I got it, I know it all. There, there's much more safety actually in being like, I have space, I have questions, I'm not sure, but I have my intention, I have my guide, right? I have an inspiration of something I want to move towards, and so this is the choice I'm going to make in this moment with faith that I'm moving in the right direction. Even though I might not know if I'm making the right choice, I'm still going to go that way, okay? Um, and then uh, let's bring up the angel. Yeah, so this is a picture I actually took. And um, I was very moved by it. Uh, basically, what had happened is that I'm sure at some point the church was white, um, but over the years, it, the whole church was very dulled and dirty. Um, and it might have just been a natural sense of the stone um, darkening as well. But in certain spots, particularly where the sculptures were of the angels, <laughs> which I didn't take for granted, um, the way the water would run off the church is the water would wash over the angels. And so over centuries, they had washed the angels into this white space. And I really felt like that was a powerful lesson for me in patience and the need for a practice. So the, the third thing that really we need as an aid as we go into our interior space is we need a regular practice and with a regular practice we need a sense of patience um, and you know to say also one of the reasons why um, this image is up is that your practice and the patience that you have with your practice is meant to purify to reveal something that has always been there Right, is meant to wash something clean and to take you to a place that is not, no one has to come and paint the angel white. <laughs> the angel's already white. The angel's already pure. The sculpture, right? Not, I mean, it's fact it's an angel, but it could be a devil up there. It doesn't matter. But it, the point is, is that she already has that quality to her. And through the, the devotion, through the discipline of staying, I'm so moved by sculpture. You know, even though it's stone, um, I have a particular love for sculpture. And I feel like it teaches me something about dedication. You know, it's like they take that position and that sculpture is in that position. Doesn't go, right? That's the power of sculpture. And so oftentimes in our practice, we need to take on the quality of a sculpture. We need to say, I'm here. You know, I'm not going to move. It gets cold outside, she doesn't move. It gets hot outside, she doesn't move. People throw tomatoes at her, she doesn't move, <laughs> right? And so we want to, you get bored, you get offended, you get exalted, you get whatever you get, you stay in your practice. You stay in, that's the mahakala. You stay in the vertical time, you don't start skipping forward. Um, so I find her very inspiring in that. And, and with that dedication, that willingness to be with something over time, what is most pure and most exquisite and most rare about your being will be uncovered, not only to yourself, but to other people, okay? Um, and to have a practice, and I know many of you in this room do have a practice, um, it means you have to renounce other things. We don't have time for everything. We just don't. <laughs> So you want to ask yourself very deeply, how much time do you spend enforcing all the habits that you have that take you away from the inner world, your inner life, if you have interest in opening to the inner kingdom? And how much time are you spending in awareness? How much time are you spending exploring that inner space? And um, you know, for most of us, the percentage is quite radical, <laughs> where it's like all of our ordinary habits, you know, 99.9% .9 of the day, and a little percentage of like sitting down and just going, what is my life for? Anyway, I mean, that's sort of the way it goes for most of us. So um, if we want to really penetrate through something, 
it's not easy to, to pierce into that space, to pierce, to rip that paper. That is not an easy process, okay? You know, and I show something like Monet, so that's 30 years every day of sitting in front of those water lilies, of having that kind of dedication. And, um, you know, we have to build up to this. It's not, most of us are not people who just click into that kind of practice. But the idea is to sort of sense within our own heart what it is that we really want, and then to get serious about that. You know, to really go towards it. Um, so, um, let's look at the, the last one. Um, and so then the fourth thing that we need is um, to really develop our ability to listen. And um, this is a photograph by Julia Margaret Cameron called The Muse, The Whisper of the Muse. And um, again, I, I'm inspired by this one in, in the sense that um, his quality of listening I just find very beautiful. And um, the fact that it's children I, sort of lightens my heart. And I'm reminded that you know, what we're listening for when we go into the inner realm, one, is not a particular message. Again, we're not listening for something. But often the messages that we get are very innocent, very simple very sweet, you know. Um, we can get so caught up in all kinds of complex ideas and complex analyses, but um, the fruit of the spiritual path is simplicity, always. Ease, innocence, openness, freshness, right? And, uh, you know, a child is a, is a good emblem of that. So, mm, I just thought we'd take a moment and, and do a little writing um, before we take a break. Um, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions and um, would just ask you to jot down some things that come to you from them. So, um, the first one is this. Um, so, imagining a guide, right? Imagining a guide for you, someone that is an emblem of where you would like to go. If that guide was witnessing you listening, say, for the past 20 minutes, 10 minutes, or the way you would normally listen to someone in a conversation, with the quality of that teacher's divine generosity and their discernment and their desire to support your path and to really move you along your path, how would they describe your listening to you? So I'd like you to write from your teacher's perspective for a moment of your own experience of your listening and to receive a message about how you were listening in a way that's going to be able to um, help you along your path. So just take a moment and do that. And you can trust whatever comes. <laughs>
So we'll just take a few more moments here. And then looking at what it is that you received, what message it was that came out. Now thinking for yourself, if there is directive in there or um, discovery in there, what is it do you imagine or are you clear that keeps you from listening in the way that you would like to or imagine you're capable of listening? What keeps you from that? And then lastly, and you may have already, you may, this may have already happened, um, is to sense what action you might take to move closer to a deeper or more beneficial, more meaningful way to listen. And it could be something that maybe you don't feel like you're capable of yet, or it could be something that you think, I could absolutely do this. Just see what comes up for you. So we'll just sit in silence for a moment. You can have your eyes open or closed, so you could choose to keep the senses out or withdraw the senses. And we'll sit in silence for two, three minutes. And I would just ask you 
to maintain an awareness of your quality of listening, perhaps with a, an intention to move towards that quality that you were just writing down or that step that you would like to make in your listening and seeing how it is for you to apply it. I don't, I'm not talking about hearing when I say listening. You're all, you all have that, right? Yeah. In your quality of consciousness, your presence, I should say. Experiment. Here we go. Two, three minute experiment. Very gently take your time in the transition. If it's meaningful for you to make a note of anything, feel free to do that. And the, the last thing I'd like to say before we take a little break um, is, is the last, I think, essential thing in terms of entering the inner space um, is that we discover and we tune into how to respect other people's quiet <laughs> and other people's reflective space, their sacred space. 
Um, so we can ask ourselves how we support the other people we encounter in having a resonant relationship with their inner being, with their vertical self. So when we're witnessing externally, as we go through our day, this is like an all-day practice, so that we're not just witnessing, you know, the water lilies or whatever it is that we've sort of said we're, we're going to move into, but we're witnessing other people on their path, and we're really seeing, trying to see them on their path and seeing how it is that they're seeking to make contact. Everyone is seeking to make contact with the inner space. And most of us, most of the time, seek to make contact with the inner space by reaching out to make contact with other people, which often is the exact opposite of what's helpful to really resonate the inner space. But some, sometimes, of course, it provides inspiration and can feed back. Um, but as I was saying earlier, when I did the, the, um, the lines, we see ourselves. So if you're able to tune in to other people resonating in their inner life, respecting moments of stillness, taking moments of silence, you will be seeing yourself and you will be growing that potential for yourself. You see, um, just because someone is not occupied does not mean they are free for you to talk to all the time. <laughs> We, we have a hard time respecting open space and, and quiet um, in, in this culture. Reflection is such a precious and sacred state. And, um, and you know, most often if someone is sitting quietly, um, most of us are so polite and we, you know, want to be kind and nice people and we feel obliged. So if someone starts talking to us, we just start speaking to them, right? And um, it takes a lot of confidence to actually say, I can't, I can't talk to you right now. And they might say, but you're not doing anything. <laughs> and um, you, know, you can say whatever you think is going to be helpful for them. right? But if you're sitting outside looking at a tree or having a, a more reflective moment and someone comes in, you know, forget about it with the phones and the computer. And you know, those are built for distraction. right? So. Um, Let's try to respect each other's space. And it actually wouldn't be a bad thing if for a period of time we all became a little bit overly careful around each other and sort of took a moment to sense where the other person is before we immediately started speaking or asking them for something, right? Or sort of just assuming their space for us to insert our agenda or making a phone call or emailing, you know, or if you live with people like, we have this sense like somehow anytime, you know, if, if I have an impulse, it's the right time for me to share it because I'm having the impulse, right, to share my YouTube video or my message or the thing I want to talk about before we actually tune in and look at the other person and say, are they trying to concentrate on something right now? Are they writing an email? Are they making a phone call? You know, what, where are they in their process? And, you know, so I think it's not to, like, live in the sense of, like, can I talk to Kelly? I don't know if I could talk to her, you know? But it wouldn't be a bad thing for a little while to get, like, our hair up a little bit on our back and go, what's going on with her? Is she, you know, is she open for it? We, we were just teaching in Sacramento, and one of the gentlemen there were, was telling us a story of his teacher, who's Gaelic Rinpoche. Um, and for those of you that don't know, Gaelic Rinpoche is a very famous um, Tibetan teacher. Uh, he has a big organization called Jewel Heart. And um, this guy was saying that when he first started to study with Gaelic Rinpoche, during the breaks, Gaelic Rinpoche would, you know, he'd be sitting up there and didn't look like he was doing anything, you know? And, um, and he said he, he went up one time and, and just sort of was like, so, you know, I'm just wondering about this thing. And Gaelic Rinpoche said, you know, he just gave him, I can't remember, did he say that he just looked at him or? Yeah, but basically it was like, you don't talk to me right now. And, you know, and he said it was like he had been burned by some kind of fire. <laughs> you know, it was great the way he described it. It was like he had been humbled and just you know, turned into ashes by, <laughs> by this man's you know, power. And, um, and that's real compassion, you see, because whatever that being, Gaelic Rinpoche, was preparing, he was preparing it for others in that moment. And he needed a moment, and he knew he needed that time. 
And so he needed to say, like, he needed to cut him off in that moment, you know? And we're not all, we don't all have enough confidence in our own practice. Most of us would just go, no, oh, anyway, so, well, you know, what do you need? So on both ends, I'm saying res try to sense and respect other people. The very least you could say, is now a good time for me to ask you this question? Or I'd love to share something with you. Is, is it OK for us to do it now? And to not be offended when the person says, no, it's not a good time. You know, most of us go like, well, it didn't seem like you were doing anything, but fine, I'll ask you later since you've got such important stuff going on or whatever. You know, it's like we get offended so easily. But just to say, like, you know, I'm respecting your space. And on the other side, to maybe become a little bit more from the compassionate side to help other people respect your space. In, you know, in a way that's kind and supports them in whatever way you think is best, but to not feel like you can't say, and maybe to cut them off if they don't have the mindfulness to ask, to say, now's not a good time for me to have this conversation for whatever reason. And you have to be mindful in yourself. You know, is that because you just don't feel like talking to them, which is something else, okay? But if you're in a reflective space and you're trying to create a place to, to enter or process something, then that's not a time to be going out at the same time, right? We can't do them simultaneously, OK? So um, we can think about that during the break. And I would say uh, we'll take a um, 10, 15-minute break. Um, and during that time, if you feel like you, it would be discerning for you to be in silence, be in silence. If you want to talk, talk. Whatever you want to do, take a walk. And uh, just let there be a sensitivity to where other people are and what would be best for them. <laughs> you okay? Yeah. On that note, let's break. <laughs> when the chairs start to fall over, we got to take a rest. 